Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Uh, I'm Mary Agnes. I'm the host of the question and answer part of the evening. So please start to think about your very smart questions. I have uh, two smart questions and a whole bunch of fairly silly ones. So please think of better ones than I might have. Um, so as you're thinking, I might start off with one question that I had that actually came out of Dr. Norman's uh, talk. You said that there's sort of this overwhelming list of challenges uh, for universities coming down the pipe, and that we need to there need to be more collaboration, they need to work together together better. That made my mind immediately go to the question of do we have too many universities and colleges? Is there how do you collaborate when everybody has when there's two in Brandon, we have three. Is that too many? And is is it an option to to amalgamate? <laughs> Putting you on the spot. <laughs> 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 to this province, and they, and, and they justly should have uh, the best services that we can provide a modest population. I think similarly in Brandon, uh, a college and a small university in Brandon would fit into the same context of a rural institution. Within the city of Winnipeg, uh, certainly uh, the University of St. Louis has uh, four. I forgot. But it serves a very, very specific population, and again, which which is easily justified. I suppose you could have the discussion as to whether or not Manitoba and Monte might be uh, subject to that kind of uh, that kind of analysis. But when you look at pretty much all the rest of the institutions, I think that they actually uh, serve very specific specific niches and very specific catchment areas which would be extremely difficult to uh, to serve from a central location like Winnipeg, which is what would happen is, is you'd be uh, you'd be servicing the law and Thompson and, and uh, Centuries Point from uh, from Winnipeg and, and I, I think you would say that, that just would not work. So I I, I, I understand uh, I understand the uh, the uh, the question that you're asking but then I look at the pieces and most of those pieces make perfect sense. And do appreciate that it is not that long ago. In fact, in 1966, when I went to United College, there was one university. Brandon College, United College, and were part of the University of Manitoba until 1967. Now, it was the expanding uh, baby boom generation that came through the system and that provided sufficient volume, if I could put it that way, to justify uh, reason, reasonable, what we would call it at the council, reasonable duplication of, of services. Now, whether that's come sufficiently under stress to reconsider that, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But it, it certainly was justified in the first instance, and most of the institutions that we're talking about are certainly justified <coughs> for certain specific groups specific accounts. Did you want to comment? Right. Yeah, I think we need to remember how these developed. And of course, they developed from very particular particular ethos. And, and we brought them together over time in a variety of ways. To me, what would make sense, and I, I, I originate from, uh, from British Columbia, I'm like Island, where there are umpteen in a very small area, uh, universities, university colleges. And what would make sense if there was some kind of heaven help us um, way to harmonize programming um, so that it was transferable across universities. Uh, in British Columbia, you can't develop a course until you, in fact, sit down with people in the other programs and develop core principles that you can agree on. You can deliver that course in a lot of different ways. And so that's the kind of thing that could work here in the province, where I had hoped Popsy would get to that point, but I mean, never did. Um, where we could, uh, where we could have 
some systemic harmonization, but I think that, that you're right, the diversity here, we have developed from diversity, and we serve very different niches. And we don't think of ourselves that way, we don't think of Manitoba that way, but there are very particular niches in Manitoba. And um, I think it goes a long way to meeting some very particular needs. Uh, and we, we might start thinking, thinking about that in a more real, substantive way. If I could just comment on the, the transfer credit side of things. Um, I taught for five years at Northern Lights College. So I've, I've been through the articulation yes. processes that you're talking about. I understand them very well, and they work very well. Although they're not particularly cheap to, no, to, to set up. It's an extremely expensive process. Um, I, I think that we are behind the curve in this province on that issue. But I think that we've also made some very significant advances over the last couple of years. Uh, one was the, the signing of, uh, I hate to use the term, a memorandum of understanding <laughs> amongst the institution uh, for that very purpose. And, and uh, the timeline that was set out uh, or developed from the MOU to, uh, to move the markers on transfer, uh, we're actually ahead of the curve on, on that. We've also taken Campus Manitoba and tasked it with the responsibility of being sort of a repository really of transfer credit uh, information. Campus so Manitoba is? Campus Manitoba, well Campus Manitoba was the, uh, the was a consortium of our post-secondary institutions designed to deliver programs into rural and remote areas. So it had a program delivery side to it, which it still has, it is it's moving increasingly to the online side from the bricks and mortar kind of thing that they had at one point. But it now has attached to a transfer credit piece, which makes perfect sense given the decentralization of the services that it's, that it's using. So uh, you're right, I think we're not where we should be, uh, but we have made some strides in the last couple of years. Andrea, any thoughts on that? You're good. Not touching that one. Okay. <laughs> good, okay. Um, so the next question I have before I start passing the mic around, there's a young man here who's going to, right over there, who's going to pass the mic around. Um, I, I did want to ask about COPSI and the demise of COPSI, which I don't think even most Manitobans necessarily knew. I mean, as a journalist, I knew, but I'm not sure I, I think most Manitobans know exactly what they did. Still does for a little longer. Um, uh, I, I want to try and get at the who's accountable question. Um, if there is, if there are all these challenges coming down the pike, um, especially financial ones, who ought to be the ultimate person or group that figures out how to fix this? Is it the universities themselves and their boards of governors, or is it the minister's office, essentially? How should that line of accountability work, exactly? I think, I mean, I need to say it's starting to you, or... <laughs> In some senses, uh, the, the, at least from a legal perspective, uh, the demise of costs doesn't change things a great deal. The authorities that were contained within the, uh, the COPS Act uh, have been extracted and are now in. Uh, I guess this is the Advanced Education Administration Act. So all of those powers went from one act to another act. The real question would be, and, and it's not a question we can answer tonight or, or maybe a month from now or six months from now, because I think it's going to take a little while to figure, to figure out what the implications are of the fallout of this, of, of this particular decision. Um, the, the question is, what kinds of advisory mechanisms will be created in order to make the kinds of decisions that you're talking about? The new act, um, in addition to the existing powers that have been transferred into uh, the, the new act, does provide for an advisory council, but that advisory council is not defined. And certainly in any discussions that I've had with the minister, uh, he has uh, basically refused to define that. I, I think, to his credit, uh, he is looking for input from institutions, from stakeholders, from student groups, from, uh, from, from economic interests within the province, 
as to what that would look like. Uh, so he didn't want, I, I, my impression of this, and he hasn't said this in so many words, but my impression is that uh, he didn't want to come forward with a fait accompli. This is gone and this is what it's going to be. Um, remember that, that uh, the minister uh, held the chair of cops prior to me. So I think he had his own views on the utility of the organization, and that may speak to, uh, to why he moved in the way he has. But he hasn't defined what those mechanisms are. So I mean, I can't really answer your question because I'm not sure. I'm not sure where we're going with this one either. Has he not given a hint, though, in his decision to disallow the University of Manitoba's plan to? He was graduate He always had that power. That power was always there. The power uh, under the Act was the minister's power, very often delegated to the council. But he still had override, override rights over council recommendations. And in some cases, uh, on things like tuition or, or fees, it, uh, the directive to the council was that the council would make recommendations to him on those items. So, in some senses, I'm not sure how much is going to change here. Uh, one thing that I think that will change is, and, and this could make the minister's life very difficult, is that the amount of lobbying that will go directly to his office is likely to increase, which means that the politicization of the process may increase and that's going to have a lot of churn uh, that goes with it. And to some degree, uh, perhaps the, the recent example that you cite of the, uh, the graduate student fee is, is a perfect example of that, that, that particular grenade landing on, on the minister's desk. Any thoughts? Andrea? Okay. Uh, well, I think that, and I wrote recently about Coxie, so it's kind of amazing that I was completely wrong, but um, <laughs> my exactly argument, yeah. <laughs> my argument was that Copsy had a great deal of potential. Um, that it had, <laughs> it sounds terrible, doesn't it? I don't mean it to sound terrible. That there is a, a significant role that I saw for an intermediary body to manage some of what um, you were talking about in terms of the drug lobbying, but also in terms of a coordination function. Right. One of the things that we have to remember in a post-secondary system is that it's comprised of a whole series of different kinds of institutions with different purposes, with different goals, with different student bodies. And when we're talking about, uh, if we talk about universities, they have very specific purposes. They place a great deal of emphasis on autonomy and their ability to make decisions and their ability to possibly not fall in line with government priorities if they so choose. And so having that intermediary body, I think, at least in principle, um, allows the management of a system that contains such a disparate group of institutions to be a little, uh, a little easier. I don't know if that's actually what was happening. But the other argument that I would make is that, um, that the organization wasn't appropriately resourced in order to have those functions and to fully fulfill those you know, the mandate that it was given. And so, I would argue that um, I saw a lot of things that could be happening um, in the council that didn't, that couldn't happen, given the way that it was structured and financed. Oh, can I just, Dr. Arnie, do you have something more? Well, no, it, it really has to do with uh, organizational development. And we know that when uh, new minister comes in, new parties come in, there's reorganization um, and rethinking about it and uh, the old gets thrown out. And very often it is just a delegation of authority in, another, in, in other functions. Sometimes it's good to have a little bit of uh, space. As you said, the minister is going to get in the neck pretty quick. If there are real problems in post-secondary, it's going to come directly to him. He's not going to have a buffer zone. Uh, but then he didn't have a buffer zone when he was uh, chair, right? So he should be used to that. And maybe that's part of it, is that that's his area of comfort, that he could 
you know, we, we take our dysfunctions with us. <laughs> sometimes. We're comfortable. Sometimes we, we cuddle our demons, right, instead of struggle with them. And so uh, sometimes we just can't. glad she said that. I, I don't have to go down there, right? I, I'm out of the university. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes it's just easier that way. Um, but when we're looking at the reorganizations of institutions, um, there are usually reasons people think about, and we're not always um, we're not always privy to them. It would be nice if we were, but maybe ten years down the road, someone's going to write a book. Andrea, if I write a book about why this happened and what could have happened, that was would have been better. Would have been better suited to our needs right now. But as with institutions all across Canada, um, we are we are struggling. We're struggling to understand ourselves because, and, and to look at issues of sustainability, because we've never really had a good look at ourselves. You know, we just take on a new model. Oh, we need a business model. We need a business plan. We need this and we need that. But we haven't really had solid time to have a good look at what we are doing and what's happening. My, my Sunday morning reading is, um, is uh, uh, a, news, uh, a newsletter I get every Sunday morning, and it's about what's happening in post-secondary institutions all around the world. <laughs> That's Sunday reading. And there is a lot happening, and there's a lot to talk about. Do you have something quick? No? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that, that at least theoretically, COPS had the, the authority to do precisely what you said. The preamble to the, to the COPS Act said that it was, it, it had a role in systems coordination. Now, I'm not convinced, and I was a that council for probably 15 years, or, or from its inception as a bureaucrat or as a, as a dean. And I was not convinced that it better to discharge its, its role. And, and certainly one of the things that I was trying to do in coming to the chair of council was to say, we're now going to do this. Now, we had done it in, in many small ways, streamlining through the processes, tightening up the requirements to actually answer the questions on the proposal forms, which <laughs> I mean, it's, it's amazing, actually, uh, some of the stuff that kind of slipped through the system. So we had done to make a more effective organization. So in some senses, I think it's demising on 